The International Trade Commission is out with an assessment checking out the impact of President Trump's U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. The commission says that the trade deal would likely have what they call a positive impact on all broad industry sectors within the U.S. economy, with manufacturing having the largest potential for percentage gains. But the new NAFTA, or the USMCA, still has to be approved by Congress. Joining us right now is Kevin Hassett. He's the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. And, Kevin, thanks for being here today. That's it's good to see you. Yeah, uh, let's run through some of what the ITC had to say, because I think there's a little bit for everybody in this sure. report. They said that they do expect U.S. exports to both Mexico and Canada to increase by 7 and 6 percent, respectively. They expect agriculture and food exports to be up by about $2.2 billion. But they also say when it's all said and done, they only expect it to boost the U.S. economy by about 0.35 percent. Um, what do you take away from this? And I know some of your own numbers are higher than what the ITC yeah, that's came right. up with. Well, well, first of all, even if you take their numbers, if you go farther out, like six, seven years out, then the number gets up above 1% of GDP. And so I think that for me, it was almost a little comical when I watched some of the news stories come out. This was a blockbuster report. This report said that the economic effect of the USMCA is double the impact of all the previous uh, things that the ITC has assessed going all the way back to 1984. So it was a blockbuster report. You know, the idea that it's a small effect is belied by, by really this. Do you remember, I came on your show a long time ago and I said we'd get about three tenths of a percent per year out of tax reform and everybody's like, oh, that's a ridiculously large number, that's <laughs> absurd, right? And so now they give us three tenths in the ITC report and people are covering it as a small effect. Let me just tell you, there was a chance that the ITC report would have been a low ball report and it would have made it much more difficult to pass USMCA. The big news last week is that the ITC report is going to help us get people on the fence to vote for it. And I think we're much, much more optimistic today than we were a week ago about our chances to get this through Congress because we've got this very, very strong and really unprecedented ITC report. Finally, uh, you're right. I've got some numbers that say that they're still missing some things that are really valuable, and we can talk about that too. But I think that even in the near term, my number is closer to 100 billion because they don't account really for the patent protection part of the of the deal, which I think is a really big deal. Let, let's talk a little bit about what this means in terms of its chances of getting passed. Uh, where, where does that stand right now? What, what kind of percentage uh, odds would you give it of being passed by Congress? Well, I think the vote counters are saying that we've got all the votes we need and that mm -hmm. Speaker Pelosi needs to bring it to the floor so that the thing can pass. And in the Senate, everything's fine. And so I think that there's broad bipartisan support for economic policies that help blue collar workers help manufacturing make the economy stronger you know create 176,000 jobs by the ITC's own numbers and so I think just as we ha saw with prison reform last year that this is going to be one of those things that is a chance for a real reasonable bipartisan moment to get something done for America. No, it's good to hear I, we, we spoke with Bob Lutz earlier um, and, mm -hmm. and he yeah. said the biggest concern for any of the auto manufacturers is going to be if, if there's nothing passed if the old NAFTA gets removed um, mm -hmm. because that level of uncertainty is really the worst case scenario they're looking at trying to make their purchasing uh, decisions one, two, three years in advance, and the uncertainty is what really kills business leaders. Right, which is why Congress really needs to move and, and get this thing passed, you know, by the end of the summer. It's something that, you know, we've now got the ITC report. Uh, you know, Ambassador Lighthizer has been meeting with everybody up on the Hill and even with people all around the country. And I think that, you know, we've yet to see anything that changes our mind that it's really a historic bill. And don't forget that the thing that the ITC recognized that I think is really interesting and awesome is that, you know, digital trade and ocean litter and all sorts of things in this trade deal are really 21st century things. And when I first got here, President Trump said, you know what's going to happen? We're going to have one trade bill. It's going to pass. And then all the other countries on Earth are going to want to copy it. And we're going to get, a, you know, basically a cascade of trade deals. And so I think that if we could get this USMCA deal passed, that we could then look forward to that cascade. And at CEA, we modeled that, too, taking the ITC numbers and sort of said, well, what if, you know, the rest of the world were to copy the USMCA deal? And then we're talking in the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of benefit for the U.S. economy. Switching gears, Kevin, if we can talk about the price of oil this morning, we're seeing that uh -huh. spike um, pretty dramatically to year-to-date highs on this mm -hmm. report uh, that uh, the U.S. will no longer grant sanction waivers uh, to those countries that are still importing oil from Iran. To what extent should we be concerned about oil and higher oil prices as a headwind to the economy to the extent that the administration seems to be very concerned about interest rates, and interest rates mm -hmm. are at historic lows? Well, the administration is very serious about taking a hard line on Iran. And if you look at, you know, the black market value of the Iranian rial has dropped by about two-thirds because our sanctions really have teeth. You know, I think that you can expect more news out of the White House, uh, you know, in, in the next few days 
on exactly what's going to happen uh, with the sanction waivers going forward. But keep in mind that you know the total Iranian production is smaller than the change in U.S. production over the last few years because of you know the horizontal drilling boom and so on. And so I think that the global oil markets are poised to be able to deal with this. And you're right that the spot price today is moving around a lot because of these uncertainties. But there's plenty of production that can come online where something to happen. So we're not going to get a tweet from the president the saying oil prices are too high, got to bring down the prices. I mean, <laughs> we shouldn't be worried about this. You know, you know, I think that oil prices fluctuate, and when oil prices are high, it's very often because the economy is a lot stronger uh, than people right. think. And that's actually the other thing that, you know, I want to talk about today, which is we got a GDP number coming out this week, and our internal numbers over at CEA got up around 3% 3, 3 for the first quarter last week with some of the good news on retail sales and so on. And so I think that we're looking at the a continuation of the 3% growth that we had last year into this year. Mm -hmm. And the first quarter usually is a little bit low. And so I think that there's almost more upside than downside risk going forward on the economy. You know, your number is higher than what a lot of uh, the banks on the street. We did see JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs both raise their numbers, but I think they raised their numbers to about 2.7 and 2.5%. Um, yeah, GDP now is at 2.8. Uh, but, but yeah, again, I, it. It's an uncertain science. There's probably about about a 0.5 uh, margin for error, and we're just a smidgen under three right now. Hey. And, and and again, uh, there's about a three tenths coming off the number because of the government shutdown and a few other special factors, which mean that the signal, if you're at 2.8, then the signal is we're still growing at three percent, and hey, that's Kevin, a very different I'm signal curious. than people expected in January, right? right? Kevin, um, I don't know yeah, if you saw, but. Uh, Steve Schwartzman, uh, founder of, of Blackstone, yeah, of course, a longtime supporter of the administration, made some, I thought, remarkable comments last week about uh, his view that actually the system currently as structured, and I think he was talking about the tax system and everything else, actually hasn't, uh, I don't know if he was saying it hasn't benefited uh, the blue-collar workers, but clearly that, that the system isn't working or isn't working well enough. At one point, he proposed this idea of not taxing teachers, and I was uh -huh. curious what you thought both of that idea, but even the broader critique of where we are, and it's a, it's a critique, the Financial Times has a big piece about it uh, over the weekend as well, and you're mm -hmm. hearing it uh, from all sorts of people in the business community. Well, I have to go back and look at what Steve said. You know, I think the world of Steve, and, and, and I'm sure that after I study what he said that there's going to be some food for thought for me in there, but the thing that I can say is that you know, the idea that blue collar workers aren't flourishing right now, well, that's belied by the fact that we've created about half a million manufacturing jobs in the two years that President Trump's been here. Uh, the idea that low income people aren't benefiting from the tax cuts, well, that's belied by a chart. You could go to the CEA Twitter feed and you can see we put it up a few weeks ago that shows that the bottom 10% of the wage distribution is actually growing the fastest with nominal wage growth last year of 6.5% for people in the bottom. And so I think right. there's a heck of a lot of good news Kevin, that exactly as we said, right. the tax cuts are going to come in, cause the economy to boom and drive Kevin, up wages the, the, for blue collar the, workers. The, the, the most provocative point he made was he said, look, uh, the current generation, uh, the bottom half of the current generation doesn't have the same opportunity that he and his generation had. Do you believe that to be true? Uh, no, I do not believe that's true. And, and, and again, I think that that looked true in 2016 and 2015. There was a heck of a lot of really bad wage data because we had a system that was chasing capital, chasing entrepreneurship offshore. And that stuff is taken off big time. And, it, and it's taken off around the country. But also, you know, we had an event last week about opportunity zones, this new policy that we have that's making sure that the capital, you know, a big chunk of the capital is headed towards distressed communities. And one of the facts I mentioned at the pre press event that we had with the president last week was that uh, the zones themselves were announced by the states in the second quarter of last year. And according to the latest Zillow data, real estate prices in distressed communities are up 20 percent relative to the second quarter of last year. And, you know, by our analysis, more than half the people that live in distressed communities own their home. And so we just gave a huge 20 percent wealth shock to most people in distressed communities all around the country. And so the idea that our policies are not reaching all across America and making all America the land of opportunity again, I think is just incorrect.